praise the Lord, First Apostolic Church. Let's all stand together on this Wednesday evening. Welcome back to the house of the Lord tonight. As I see some folks still making their way in the sanctuary, why don't we take just a moment, why don't you reach across the aisle, why don't you greet someone and welcome them to the house of the Lord tonight. If you're watching us online tonight, welcome. I'm so glad that you're tuning in with us this evening. So excited about what God has in store for us tonight. What an amazing kickoff to 23 that we had on Sunday. Um, an amazing message from Pastor Carpenter. He opened up talking about the blessing of a new beginning. Uh, what a wonderful message. And then uh, evangelist Michael Maupin joined us Sunday night. And then he preached about what will we name the baby. Had a couple of people baptized Sunday night. Aren't you glad that people are still coming to an altar of repentance? being baptized in his name and being filled with his spirit. Now that we've, uh, we've taken just a moment to welcome each other, now why don't we go ahead and do what we've come to do tonight, and that's welcome the presence of the Lord to come down in this place and begin to exalt his name. Come on, church family, would you help me lift up the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name. Father, we love you tonight. God, we're so thankful for bringing us back together, God, as a corporate body. God, we're here tonight to give you our very best praise. God, we want our hearts to be pointed toward you in such a manner tonight, God, that our song, the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart, God, the words of our mouth tonight, God, would bring, would bring glory and honor to your name, God, that there would be a great demonstration of your power tonight. God, a great demonstration of your anointing, God, that would fall in this place tonight. God, we're going to lift up your name. We're going to give you praise. Come on, would you put your hands together? You're thankful to be in his house tonight.
conqueror tonight, why don't you lift up some praise? Lift up his name tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, could you just keep your hands raised to him tonight? God, we crown you with blessing. God, honor, strength, and power in your house tonight. God, we declare it. On church, let's just continue to lift up the name of Jesus right now. Lord, we love you, Heavenly Father. The glory is yours, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, mighty God. Praise the Lord, church. How many is thankful to be here on this Wednesday afternoon? The greatest place on all the earth, amen? No greater place than to be in the house of God, where God is here to meet us in our need, amen.
How many is thankful that we have a place that we can bring our needs? I don't ever want to take that for granted. You know, David said in Psalm chapter 5, he said, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. I believe right now that God's ear is bent towards this service right now, and that he hears us, and that only he not only hears our cries of our heart, but he wants to meet us in our need. Amen? We have a loving Savior, a Savior that wants to come in and give us a peace, give us rest, give us healing in the name of Jesus. Many prayer requests have been brought before us tonight. Please remember the family, Brother Steve Sanderson, his mother passed away recently. Please pray for the comfort for that family. Continue to pray for Brother Carl Salyards that God would give him a complete healing in his body. Continue to touch and, and pray for Brother Randy Newcomer. He's been sick for a while and, and we just, we want to lift him up in prayers. Taylor Wooford, let's continue to remember Sister Michi and Sister Linda Tom, Thompson. We had a couple prayer requests come through today. Zareel Coffin, she was recently diagnosed with cancer, 18 years old. And let's remember a co-worker of Sister Sonia Fowler, Liz Hayworth. She is sick. I believe that she had had a stroke. Let's remember her and pray for her. Anybody else have a need? I see many hands across this, this auditorium. I don't know every single need in this room right now, but God does. And so let's just take our needs before the throne of God right now. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Mighty God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God. Lord, to bring our needs and our petitions and our supplications before you, oh God. Lord, we humbly stand here today, God. Lord, we cannot do anything apart from you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, for your divine, Lord, healing, Lord, to come into this room, Lord. Lord, allow the blood, Lord, that you shed for our sins, God. Lord, that same blood that purchased our healings, Lord, to come in and touch every need in this room, Heavenly Father. Lord, we ask you to touch every need that was brought before you, God. Lord, you know every situation. Lord, we just believe, God, that you hear our cries and that you hear our prayers tonight, Heavenly Father. Lord, and we believe, Lord, by faith in Jesus' name that not only you hear us, God, but you're going to answer us according to your will. In the matchless name of Jesus, we give it all praise and honor and glory to Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. How many believes that he heard us? How many believes that he's going to answer us? So thankful again and praise the Lord. So great to see everyone here on this Wednesday afternoon. It is offering time here at First Apostolic Church. The ushers would be making their way at this time. And please, uh, as you can see, the pastoral family, they are away at a time of much needed rest and recharging for the new year. We know that Pastor and all his family, Pastor Erickson and his family, Pastor Hammond, Pastor Nolan, and all their family, they labor so hard and intensely all year long. And so this is a good time for them to get away. And we're so happy that they've been able to do so. But they send their love and regards to each and every one of you tonight. Um, please be um, in, in, in mind of the fact that we have our Bible reading for the year. They wanted me to make sure that we announce this. No greater way, amen, than to start a new year. I know there's lots of resolu- uh, New Year's resolutions. You know, we, we went by the gymnasium the other day and it was completely packed out. But this right here is the greatest way that we can start off a new year by diving into God's Word and letting it be a priority for us to be able to read the Bible through in a year. Amen? It's a good challenge for us. And we are also looking forward to our 21 days of prayer, which will begin January the 11th. It'll be from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., Monday through Friday in the main sanctuary. Please come out. Bombard the altar area. Everybody come out all you can. Prayer changes things. The two greatest things, reading in God's Word and getting this Word in our heart, And through prayer, amen, the greatest way that we can start the year. Amen? Marriage retreat. 
How many is looking forward to the marriage retreat? Woo-woo, I'll say it. It's a highlight of the year, and we are looking forward to the dynamic ministry of Brother Raymond Woodward. I think we've heard of him. He's been around, and, and we know that he's going to greatly bless us, and, and I'm just looking forward to that. Amen? How many knows that God loves a cheerful giver in this place? Amen? That's right. Give the Lord a hand clap for praise. So thankful that all that God does for us. And it's a blessing to be able to come into his house and to give back into his kingdom. Let's pray right now over this offering. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, again, we come before your throne, God, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, thanking you, God, for this place of worship you've allowed us to be, Lord, a part of. Lord, we thank you, God, for our places of employment. Lord, we just ask you right now to bless this offering, multiply it only as you can to let it go to further your kingdom according to your will and according to your purpose. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. amen. Give unto the Lord. My story's just begun Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burden
One more time. How many is thankful to be in the Father's house tonight? Lord, we thank you, Jesus, our Father. We thank you, Lord, as sons and daughters. Amen. You can be seated in the house tonight. Again, it's so wonderful to be here with each and every one of you on this Wednesday night. I forgot to mention one of our elders, dear brother Claiborne, he wanted me to make mention that today is his sweet wife's birthday, Sister Claiborne. And let me read on here what he wrote, okay? She is officially a trendsetter. This is this is what's written. How many loves the Claiborne's? We love and appreciate them. We're so thankful. We had a lot of guests, and, and Pastor let me know that that we had a special guest coming tonight, Brother Anthony Simmons and his son. They're here all the way from Alabama. Brother, Sam, uh, brothers, I'm so sorry, Brother Anthony Simmons, he pastors a church in Trinity, Alabama, and he currently serves the AOJC as the super, the assistant superintendent of the district in Alabama. And we want to let him come up and greet the congregation tonight. Everybody put your hands together for Brother Anthony Simmons. Thankful for him and his, bro his son being here with us in Jesus' name. Thank you, my dear brother, and praise the Lord, each one. It's certainly good to be in service with you on this special evening. Uh, and I want to give honor to Bishop Carpenter and the pastoral staff here, as well as the great congregation of Maryville, Tennessee. Uh, even though I'm from Alabama, we have a connection that, um, <laughs> that extends way back to 86 when I signed to play for the Maryville football team down the road. It's been a few years ago now, and um, on this journey with my son, visiting and having a vacation, I asked him, I said, where would you want to go before you start back to college? Uh, he said, well, let's go to Pigeon Forge. And I said, well, there's a church right up the road. I'd love for you to be able to experience. And thank you, thank you for being a lighthouse, for being a place where people on vacation want to come. You're an extension reflection of the pastor. And you know what? He would be so proud. I'm not even a part of this church, but y'all just went hitting without a miss. I mean, just like they're not even here. This is beautiful. One thing that, and I'll shut up after this, but one thing I would like to say is that recently God laid it on my heart as I was preaching our congregation, John chapter four, preached the message, the difference is worship. And it never hit me like it did as I was ministering, how that as the Lord sat there and taught with the lady, how that worship came into the conversation. She brought it up, supposing him to be a prophet. But this is what she said, our fathers worshiped. I don't worship, but our fathers worshiped. <laughs> Jesus directly pointed the conversation back to her, said, woman, the hour cometh and now is. I'm looking forward to a time where we can worship for eternity with the Abrahams, the Isaacs, and the Jacobs. But if that generation could come back and see this generation, let there be a separation with the dress or the trends of the day. But my God, don't let it be a difference in worship. We still worship the same way they worshiped. You know, the kind of worship that would cause a man to laden the ox and the ass and the horse and go out for a few days. They didn't go to vacation. They went to worship. I and the lad are going worship. Now, we may have went to vacation in Pigeon Forge, but we had worship on our mind tonight here with you. Thank you for that. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I don't know about you, but that inspires me, the fire of the Holy Ghost and Pastor Simmons. Amen. Fires us up.
Everybody can stand at this time. We have another special guest, a family all the way from La Follette, Tennessee. Pastor Jeff Moses and his wife and son and daughter-in-law, they are here tonight to be with us. And they have been blessing the body of Christ for many years. I believe they spent many years on the evangelistic field. And they have been pastoring for quite some time in La Follette. And we're just so honored to have Pastor Moses. Let's put your hands together as he comes and blesses us with the Word of God. He is the man of the hour. And we're so thankful for what God is doing in La Follette. Praise the Lord, everyone. You can be seated. So good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to be here on a Wednesday night. I was... Um, I don't have much room here, do I? I mean, Brother Carpenter didn't want me to have much room. Some folks preach with those um, faith books and iPads. I'm too old for that. If it went out, I don't know what I'd do. So I, I call that a faith book. I'm just using the old-fashioned papers like we used to. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to be with this great church in Maryville. It's already been said, I want to give honor to Bishop and Sister Carpenter and their family. You, you may not pay much attention to it here, but if you'll just let me talk to you for just a few minutes. This, this pastor and his family don't just serve this community or this church. They they serve the district. They serve national positions. Brother and sister Nolan Carpenter, brother and sister Zach Hammond, brother and sister Chad Erickson have all committed their lives. I want you to hear me. They have committed their lives to the kingdom of God and to the service of the church. And we honor them tonight. I told my wife before, that when I heard they were going to be in Florida, I said, if there was ever a family that needed a break, it's exhausting to see where they're at, what they're doing. If there's a September with 20 minutes free, on some afternoon, they're going to start another program. They, they always seem to be busy doing something, and they deserve this time off. But I want to also thank you, this church, for sharing your bishop and your pastoral staff with an organization that needed them. I don't wanna get into any details about, but, about that, but this organization needed them for such a time as this. Amen, I shudder to think where we would be if it was not for your pastor. They are never, they have never been position driven people they're, they're people that are driven by the kingdom. Brother Zach Hammond, I'll get to my message in just a minute. Let me, let me just talk to you for a minute. Brother Zach Hammond preached a powerful anointed message at NYC. And it was effective because there were many young people there that probably heard a message about the coming of the Lord, the rapture, and hell for the first time in their lives. There are some people sitting in churches right now tonight all across the country. Some, many are in our fellowship that if it had not been for him preaching a message that was unpopular, some of them would have never heard it because their pastors will not preach it. And I'm gonna tell you, and I've said this to Brother uh, Hammond to his face, but I think it's far better to be afraid than to be ignorant. And God help us not to be giving apologies after preaching the word of God. Amen. There are people all over the apostolic ranks, all around the country, around the world, that watch this program faithfully every week. Do you know that? You say, well, they just like the church. They like the music. 
Don't deceive yourself with that. Many of them live in Sardis. The church had a reputation in the book of Revelation. They were busy. Their reputation was as they were alive. We got a lot of things going. We're a busy church. We've always got things for the people to do. But the Lord said, you're really dead. He said, you're really dead. But he also said, thou hast a few names, however, in Sardis, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Even in a dead church, there are some folks that want to make it. Even in a dead church, there are some folks that love God and want to hear the word. Do you realize what a service it is that your pastoral staff provides when they preach on holiness and faithfulness and separation from the world, when they preach the oneness of God, the oneness of God in Christ, when they preach baptism in Jesus' name? Do you realize the service they're providing to those that live in Sardis, those that are going to dead churches that would never hear it if it didn't come out of Maribel? I, will, I hope to God that this pastoral staff will always preach the truth. Stay with the foundation and never, God help us to never be apologetic for preaching what the Word of God says. Amen. Let them preach holiness without having to give a disclaimer before they preach it. You need to love it. You need to get excited about it because this is a testimony that you can still build a church and preach the Word of God. Many other churches in Sardis, they're hearing it for the first time when they hear it here. Amen. And I, I appreciate this church. Amen. I pray for this church every day. I pray for God to bless your finances, let you reach farther than you've ever reached. Amen. Because I believe God put this church here for such a time as this. My son and daughter-in-law are here. I'm glad that Denver and Chrissy are here. I, I met Brother Marshall a little while ago and, and Brother Simmons. We're glad to meet them. It's great to meet them. We've got friends here, several around the building, and I appreciate their friendship. I, I mentioned to Brother White that he's been a nail in a sure place and so faithful all these years, and I appreciate that. I'm going to go to the book of Matthew the 24th chapter. You can remain seated if it's all right. I know it's your custom to stand, but I've got a lot of, I don't want you to stand for all that I'm going to talk about. I was honored to be asked about three weeks ago to maybe talk to you tonight about some Bible prophecy. And I started right away studying for this service and I began with over 560 pages of notes. And I had to condense them down to about 10 pages, 12 maybe. There are things I would love to say tonight that there'll be no time to say. I will leave more unsaid than I'll say. But I want to try to help you to see that God is trying to get our attention Jesus is coming, and God is trying to get our attention. In the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, the disciples of Jesus were marveling at the grandeur of the temple. Verse 1 said, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Nothing is said now for 20 minutes. As they walk now from the Temple Mount over to the Mount of Olives, and verse 3 picks up the setting again after the silence. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, 
They didn't ask the question in front of everyone there, but tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Jesus, you can't just drop this bombshell on us and then not explain what you mean. Because if the temple is gone, that means that sacrifices are going to cease and Jewish life, as we have always known it, it'll be over. Of course, Jesus didn't tell them, listen, don't bother asking questions about the end because it's not for you to know. That's why some churches never hear about the coming of the Lord because they take that attitude. One third of the Bible is prophecy. 90% deals with the day we're living in right now. Jesus didn't tell them not to bother about that because it was, it was not for them to know, but he went into great detail about what signs they should be looking for. I don't have time to read them all, but not less than five times in this chapter, he told them, don't be deceived. Verse 6 said, and he said, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now keep in mind, Jesus just told them the temple is going to be completely destroyed. It's going to be leveled to the ground. And it happened in 70 AD because when Titus and the Roman legion set the set the temple on fire, the, go the fire got so hot it burnt the gold, melted the gold that was around the crown of the top of the temple and it ran through the cracks of the stones and so the Romans picked every stone, turned it over to get the gold that was still there. It happened like Jesus said. But he told them the temple would be completely destroyed, leveled to the ground and then verse 15 he said, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Who shall, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Some historians believe that Daniel was talking about the defilement of Antiochus Epiphanes around 167 BC, which led to the Maccabean revolt, which precisely three, day, uh, three years after Antiochus defiled the temple, Judas Maccabeus had come and rededicated the temple in 164 B.C. But that's more than 160 years before Jesus was even born. So Jesus is referring here to a future event. It's going to come at the end during the Great Tribulation. A time described in the scripture is a time of Jacob's trouble not the church's trouble. A time when the temple will be rebuilt, the Antichrist that Daniel spoke about during the great tribulation, he's going to defile that temple also. Verse 21 said, for then shall be great tribulation. This is what Jesus is saying. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He already knew about the defilement that happened in 167. 160 years before he was born, but he said none of that in the past compares to what's getting ready to be leashed, unleashed upon this world. He speaks of that tribulation period again in verse 29 when he said, after the tribulation of those days, he's coming back to set up a kingdom. Verse 32, he gives us one more sign to bring it all together. He said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branches yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near and even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not of the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He's saying, I can't give you the date. That's not for you to know. But if you'll pay close attention, he said, you'll clearly be able to see the season approaching. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob was blessing his sons. And he said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, in verse 10. 
That means that the Messiah had to be born before the Jews lost the right to enact the death penalty because the death penalty then was stoning. He had to be born before the Jews lost the right to enact the death penalty, but he had to die after the scepter departed because he was to die by a Roman execution that had not even been known for hundreds of years. The power to inflict capital punishment had been taken away from them the very year that Jesus was crucified. So the scepter departed from Judah and the, the, uh, the Romans took over the crucifixion. So he died like the Bible said. Why? Because the, the psalmist already said, I, they pierced my hands and feet. Psalms 22 and 16. Zechariah said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for an only son. Zechariah 12 and 10. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not knowing the times and the seasons of their visitation by the Messiah in Luke chapter chapter 19 and 44. When the wise men went to King Herod, they were, they were asking for, where is this Messiah, this king of the Jews that is supposed to be born? And what did Herod tell him to do? Let's ask the religious leaders. Ask the religious leaders and they'll tell you exactly where the Messiah would be born. But when Herod demanded to know when the star appeared, it was because he wanted to know how old the child was. Now, since they knew that the Messiah would fulfill both the role of a king and also a priest, he could not begin his earthly ministry until he was 30 years old. So they could have easily determined when the Messiah would be born simply by, or would appear simply by adding 30 years to when he was born. Deductive reasoning or simple mathematics, they could tell how old he was supposed to be. But even if they missed that, Daniel told them exactly what day the Messiah would be declared Messiah and rejected. In Daniel chapter 9, when the command was given to restore and build Jerusalem, that would start the time clock. And according to Nehemiah chapter 2, Artaxerxes gave the command to Nehemiah to go build the wall, and it was on March the 14th, 445 B.C. It was that command that began the first of the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, which would end 69 weeks later. But Daniel 9.24 said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And it would conclude 69 weeks later, exactly 483 years later, when the Messiah would be publicly identified and rejected on April the 6th, 32 A.D. The angel told Daniel it'll be in troublous times. Uh, Nehemiah said, I had a sword in one hand and a trial in the other. And then exactly 483 years to the day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on April the 6th, 32 AD, and the crowd cried, Hosanna to the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisee said, you need to make them hold their peace. Jesus said, no, uh, they're not going to hold their peace. If the stones hold, if they hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. Why? Because it could not be tomorrow. It could not be last week. It had to be on this day. He had to be declared to be the Messiah and rejected by the people. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you tonight that the Bible is accurate. You don't have to worry about the accuracy of the word of God. If it was prophesied, it will be fulfilled exactly like the words said he was going to fulfill the prophecy of Daniel but the 70th week or the last seven years of the 490 years it would start with the great tribulation or the time known as Jacob's trouble and that may very well happen this coming fall Daniel set the date and they still missed it. This is why so many scholars believe that although we don't know the precise day that Jesus will come for his church, we can know the times and the seasons when his return is near because Jesus told us exactly what to watch for. Most scholars agree that the fig tree is Israel and the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will see the end. Do you realize that Abraham was born in 1948 B.C.? 
the nation of Israel was reborn in 1948 A.D., the very day that Israel was made a nation and the flag of David went up the pole for the first time under King, uh, since King Zedekiah had been carried away into Babylon. Do you realize that when they, the flag w uh, went up the pole for the first time that Yigel Yadin walked into the uh, prime minister's office and said, we have found the word of God. What was he talking about? The Dead Sea Scrolls. On the same day, the flag went up the pole. And you know what the very first legible words uh, that they found in the scrolls uh, when they blew off the dust uh, and they could see words that were etched there when they read the word, it was from Ezekiel 37 and 3. Can these bones live? I want to tell you the rebirth of Israel rising from the ashes of the Holocaust proves that these bones can live. Uh, uh, Ezekiel didn't know it. He said, thou knowest. Uh, but God knew all along uh, there's going to be a rebirth. Uh, there's going to be a powerful revival that's going to come uh, to the Jewish people. But it's also coming to the church. Abba Eben was asked at the United Nations General Assembly after the successful Six-day war, how is it possible that such a small nation could win such a victory? He leaned into the microphone and said, because the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. It was not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It's not just a, a, a lucky twist of fate. It was all part of God's divine plan, and nobody can stop it. I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm glad I know the truth. I'm glad I'm looking up. I'm not worried about Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. This is not our gloomiest hour. This can be our greatest hour. More happened in 1948 than just the birth of Israel. It was a year of beginnings, new beginnings around the world. Israel was born in 1948. Yigel Yadin found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The National Council of Churches was formed. The beginning of the European nation's common market occurred. The communist over Russia uh, ran Czechoslovakia and barricaded Berlin. Those two events triggered what we call the North Atlantic Treaty Organization known as NATO. That year also saw what's known as the formation of American states. Uh, the Index of Leading Indicators was formed in 1948. The space program began in 1948. UFO research began in 1948. The microchip was invented in 1948 and the Treaty of Rome was revived again in 1948. All of them setting up for the redemption of the Jews and the closing of the Gentile door of salvation. It's what Rabbi Heimrichman called God's grand finale. Hallelujah. The angel told Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. It's on thy people. It's on the Jews. It's on the holy city, Jerusalem. Just three months ago, on, on October the 5th, Israel just marked their 70th year jubilee. From the day the children of Israel first stepped foot into the promised land. And so they're declaring that this is the year of the Messiah. They're exciting things because they point to the end. But there's another event that was on the surface that seemed like it had no prophetic significance, neither to us or Israel. And yet within a few days, we all realized COVID-19 had changed the world. It set into motion a series of end-time prophetic events like nothing we've ever seen in human history. I heard one preacher say there were only two events in human history that ever shut down the whole world. One was the flood of Noah's day. The other was COVID-19. Noah was locked away in that ark for one year and two months. The world was locked down by COVID for one year and two months. When COVID first shut down, uh, shut, shut down our churches, I'm telling you, I walked the floors because I was so troubled. I was feeling something. I told my wife, I said, something big has changed in the spirit world, something like we've never seen before. And I, I, I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how to respond to it. We've never been here before. Brother Raymond Woodward got up to preach. 
He said while preaching from an empty building, he said this virus has literally moved the whole world online. And now the church is just something else we do online. He said even when some restrictions are lifted, we will not even be able to define what our new normal is going to be because government officials and political leaders will decide what that's going to be. He also said if our fathers could have seen our day, they would have been scared to death. But our generation doesn't even seem to notice. He said the awareness is so low and yet the stakes are so high because we live in a time of casual Christianity. Hallelujah. I think God is trying to get our attention. Brother Anthony Mangan got up from a sick bed. His family said, please don't go to church. He got up, he said, I had to be here. He said, I've been very, very sick. He said, but I felt an urgent, uh, urgent moving of the Holy Ghost telling me I've got to preach this message. Uh, he went and preached about the, the church, he said, is living in the last hours of the last days. He said, if the church is out of here in Revelation chapter 4, and we're now seeing the 8th and ninth chapter of Revelation being set up before us, then how close must we be to chapter 4? Brother Jason Barnum preached a very powerful, stirring message in this pulpit about how close the coming of the Lord is in a message he entitled, I Dreamed a Dream. Bishop Carpenter preached here about the abomination of desolation, and he said, I believe we're about to segue into the final moments of the church. He said, I don't want us to live in fear, but neither do I want us to live in ignorance. So as the church... We must not ignore what's going on. We must be prepared. He talked about, you remember he talked about the magician that distracts you with one hand while all the deception is really going on in the other hand. And we need to be, we need to be aware of what's going on in the world. He said, we can't just know the truth. We need to love the truth. My God, I've been ringing that bell in our church for 10 years. It's not enough to know it. You gotta fall in love with it. You don't tolerate it. You gotta fall in love with it he said this church he said the church is what's restraining the antichrist and his control over the world but when the church is raptured and the man of sin is going to have free reign when he said that it let me know we're on the same page he said it's about a one world government and a one world system where there is no bible and man is his own god do you remember him preaching that he said, we're marching toward the rapture and the revealing of the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon. And what's coming after the rapture is going to make our current crisis look like a cakewalk. He said, I don't want to be here when that comes on the world. The countdown has started. And there's only one way to escape what's coming on the earth, and that is the rapture. When folks got upset because Brother Zach Hammond preached about rapture anxiety, I don't care what they say, preach it again. Turn the volume up and preach it again. Make sure everybody knows the Lord is coming and you got to get ready or you're going to be left behind. Brother Raymond Woodward, he was preaching after the War in Ukraine began. He said, I'm not preaching prophecy tonight because I'm an expert on the subject. I'm preaching it because it would be pastoral malpractice to see what's happening in the world and not say anything about it. Ladies and gentlemen, if the house is on fire and I'm in it, and you don't want to offend me by getting me all worked up, you know I get anxiety when somebody tells me the house is on fire. So you just keep that to yourself and you all sneak on out the side somewhere. No, I'd rather feel the anxiety and you let me know I got to get out of it. We need somebody to preach the truth. Somebody needs to preach the truth. We don't need a counselor. We need somebody to preach, to preach the word. God is trying to get our attention. I don't have time to preach on the Bereshit prophecy or the Shemitah cycles. But I can tell you that if they're right, if the genealogies listed in the Bible are right, 
then we may only have a year or two before the great tribulation begins. And the church is caught out of here. There were seven feasts of the Lord. Feast of Passover. Jesus died at the feast of Passover. The feast of unleavened bread when he laid in the tomb and he, he did not rise from the dead. And then the feast of first fruits. That's when he rose from the grave. Fifty days later, the feast of Pentecost. But there were three feasts that are still yet to come to be fulfilled. And that's the feast of trumpets. When the final ingathering is brought in. And the great day of atonement, which will be the great tribulation. And the feast of tabernacles, where he will come here and tabernacle among men. The first four were fulfilled when Jesus was on this earth because he fulfilled all of them in the life, death, burial, and resurrection. But the last three are still yet to come. At the rapture of the church, the suffering of the tribulation, the setting up of Jesus' earthly kingdom at the end of the great tribulation. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will see everything else come together to set the stage for the end of the church age, the rapture of the church, the great tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist. Daniel said in the last days, man's knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge began to increase at the turn of the 20th century. At the same time, latter rains began to fall in the land of Israel. At the same time, there was a prayer meeting going on in Topeka, Kansas that started the Azusa Street revivals that spread all over the world. John Hagee said a few months ago at a dedication of something he was doing in Israel, he said his grandfather preached for 50 years. He only lived to see one end-time prophecy fulfilled in his lifetime, and that was the rebirth of Israel. He said, my father preached for 50 years. He only lived to see two end-time prophecies fulfilled. That was the rebirth of Israel and the miracle of the Six-Day War. But then he went on to say, we have seen so much Bible prophecy fulfilled in the last 12 months that we literally cannot keep up with it. It's true. It's true. I've got up on Monday morning and found some article. thought, this is powerful. This is a scream, an alarm sounding to the church. This is powerful. But by the time Wednesday gets there, that story's already, it's gone. Another something bigger came on the scene. It's happening so fast, we can't keep up with it. One writer said there's been more prophecy fulfilled in this generation than all the 19th century since Christ combined. 2 Peter 3 and 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. We're quickly drawing to a close of the sixth millennium since the sin of Adam, or 6,000 years of man's time. I don't have to get time to get into that. But the angel told Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even until the time of the end, for many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge was at a standstill for thousands of years. But according to Time Life books of the 20th century, it says at the turn of the century, we went from the wagon wheel technology to the moon in about 40 years. There have been more earthquakes and volcanoes in this century than all the 19th century since Christ. Ronald Reagan said after the Berlin Wall fell, he said when all the answers to all the world problems are contained in the pages of that little black book, the Bible, then how do we as Americans think we can live without it? He said maybe, just maybe, it's much later than we think. I'll say amen to that. Americans have lost all respect for morals, purity, life, and God. They want God out of our schools, out of our homes, out of our governments, off of our money, out of the Pledge of Allegiance, out of Christmas, out of Easter, off the radio, off television, I can assure you it won't be much longer. We're going to be out of everything. We're going to be caught away to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with him. America's not only in decline, America's in a free fall. Amen. God is trying to get our attention. 
The members of the LGBT trans community now have more voice in the government than the church has. The world has gladly embraced the LGBTQ agendas while rejecting the church, labeling us as crazy fools that are dangerous bigots out of touch with mainstream America. They're even wanting to label the Bible as hate speech. We live in a country where you go to jail for breaking an eagle's egg. But you can slaughter two million human babies a year, even some seconds from birth, and nobody seems to be offended by it. Brother Lee Stone King spoke at the United Nations General Assembly. He preached a seven-minute message from Acts 2.38, and he told them that Jesus is the answer that they were looking for. That message was translated in real time into every known language on earth, fulfilling the prophecy from Matthew chapter 24 and 14, that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. I'm telling you, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. I don't care how much you hate the truth. If you don't have the truth, you're going to be lost. Somebody said, well, I'm not going to be a part of that. Yes, you will. But when the Lord comes, your knee is going to bow and your tongue's going to confess he is Lord. You know what? I want to do it now when it's my own will, my own desire. I want to do it because I love him and I know he's preparing something great for us. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12 Daniel said, in the last days, man's knowledge would be increased. Jeremiah chapter 18, the Lord said, if you forget me, Israel, I'll make your land a land of perpetual hissing. How would he do that? By shutting off the latter rain in its season. The Jewish record shows that when the temple was destroyed and the Jews were dispersed all over the world in 70 AD, that not a single drop of latter rain fell that year. And for 1,920 years, it did not rain a single drop of latter rain in Israel. But the Lord said in Joel chapter 2, verse 21, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. How would he do it? By restoring the rain in its season. At the turn of the century, 1901, Jews began to migrate back to Israel. And for the first time in 1,920 years, it began to rain latter rain in its season. It's not a coincidence that in the same breath the Lord said also, in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. At the same time there was latter rain falling. At the same time the industrial revolution began in 1900. From 1900 to 1918 there were more inventions in the first 18 years of that century than all the history of mankind up to that point combined. Knowledge had been increased. The latter rains are falling. But in January 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, the Holy Ghost fell in a prayer meeting that sparked the Azusa Street Revival. Knowledge has been increased. Revival, or Israel is restored, and the, the Holy Ghost is again setting the world on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you can say you believe that God can do anything, but I'm telling you, he can do anything. He can do everything. He can do all things, even things beyond your faith's reach. I've been preaching in our church about the Zusa Street revivals. If I would ask you how many believe God can do anything, heal anything, you would, in a microsecond, every hand would go up. But if I start telling you about miracles that happened in Azusa Street, you would, I'd start losing you. We believe he can heal a headache. And he can heal, sometimes he'll heal a cancer. But what about creative miracles? If I told you that eyeballs at Azusa Street grew in the sockets that had no eyeballs, I lost you. If I told you there's eyewitness reports of limbs that were severed growing back on, I lost you. Amen. I lost you. But William Seymour 
stood at the end of the Azusa Street Revival and he prophesied. He said that in 100 years, about 100 years, he said another revival greater than Azusa Street greater than Topeka, Kansas, greater than the book of Acts is coming. And it will not be restricted to one place or to just preachers, but it will spread all over the world and it will end with the coming of the Lord. He repeated that prophecy over and over again before he died in 1922. Meanwhile, on the other coast, on the east coast, in just a day or two apart, Brother Charles Parham, he prophesied the same thing. Do you know we're living in that time right now? Do you know there's creative miracles that are going on right now around the world where our faith can't touch that yet, but it's coming. I believe it's coming. We're going to see powerful signs and wonders and miracles as God gets the church ready to leave this world. I don't believe he's coming after a dead church, a lazy church, a wore out church, a worldly church. He's coming after a people that are looking for his return. We've made ourselves ready. Brother Charles Robinette left the mission field to share a vision he had. God gave him of a billion soul revival that's already started in a message he entitled Greater Things. He said the Lord showed him that denominal people are going to be coming and backsliders are coming. I've been preaching this to our church for a long time. This encouraged me. I wanted to hear some confirmation. I believe when I pray I feel like God God shows me that there are as many people out there that love God in denominal churches as love him in our churches. They just need a preacher with a revelation. They need a preacher with a revelation. And God is giving them revelation. They're beginning to see Jesus' name baptism. They're beginning to see the oneness of God in Christ. They're beginning to see the infilling of the Holy Ghost talking in tongues. And God is filling them. He is changing their lives. I heard a month or so ago, somebody told me about a Trinitarian pastor of a large church. He said he, 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 was, he got a revelation of Jesus named baptism. And he said when he got that revelation, he tried to get somebody to baptize him. And they wouldn't do it. So he baptized himself. Another preacher, he started preaching Acts 2.38 and the oneness of God. He got the Holy Ghost and they kicked him out. Listen, there's people that are hungry. They're seeking for it. Pray for your church, but pray for those churches. Pray that God gives them revelation. Revelation. He gives them understanding. Pray that God lets them tune in to your broadcast. And then loose the hands of your preacher and let him preach the word. Don't try to hold him back. Somebody's in Sardis that needs to hear it. I've been preaching for 30 years about the ashes of the red heifer all over this country. I got up back in September. I think it was a Friday morning. And I saw a headline that said five perfect red heifers were delivered to Israel overnight. I was overwhelmed with emotion all day. I walked the floors. I cold chills all day. I don't have time to cover that. I'd love, to, I'd love to have the time to do that, talk about the red heifer. It would, some of you would make you run to the altar and others would make you shout in the aisles, Jesus is coming. Oh, we're going to see it. We're going to see it. I don't have time to talk about the red heifer, but, but when I saw that, Headline, I had been talking about an emergency Aliyah conference that was held in Jerusalem the Sunday before, just the week before, where they were trying to consolidate, consolidate all the Orthodox Jews in Israel for consolidating all of their efforts to call all the Jews all over the world, especially the 46% of Jews that are in America, to come back home now. It's an emergency. Come back home now. They're in a tour. They're going around right now, right now. 
in the next month or two, they're going to be going around to all Jewish Orthodox communities around America and other parts around the world telling them the exile is over. You have to come home now. I wondered why they were speaking in terms of the end of days. They were talking about global trouble that's coming upon this world and especially upon the Jewish people. They spoke very clearly and very directly about the final wave of Jewish migration back to Israel that started in 2019. And they said that door is closing quickly. They were stressing something big. I'm quoting. Something big is about to happen and the only safe place in the world for Jews is going to be Israel. You need to come home now. Well, I was intrigued by that. But I didn't know what was getting ready to happen the next week. The late Paul Harvey said in two of his noonday broadcasts, he said the coming home of the red cow is the next forecastable world event. He said there was a Yiddish writing that had been recently rediscovered that had named some very important events down to the very letter in the life of Israel all the way up to the Iraqi war, even to the point of naming some of the countries involved. He went on to say this, however, is not what excited the Orthodox Jew, but it was the event immediately following that, and that was the redemption of Israel. He said Israel cannot be redeemed until she repents. She cannot repent until she comes home and the red cow will call her home. The prayer of the Jew is Messiah come home. Messiah come home. End of quote. I told my wife, I said it's easy now to see why Donald Trump and Joe Biden were both God ordained presidents who are both divinely appointed for this particular moment in human history to bring about the fulfillment of an eternal purpose. It took someone with the boldness of Donald Trump, had no connections to any political lobbyist. He didn't need their money. He didn't use their power or influence to manipulate or, con or, or, or corrupt his ideas. He recognized Jerusalem as the eternal capital of the Jewish people. And to prove it, he moved the U.S. Embassy there. In fact, I just read a couple of weeks ago that Donald Trump did more for Israel. This is from Benjamin Netanyahu. He said Donald Trump did more for Israel than any other American president in history. But it also took the weakness of a leader like Biden combined with the power, global power grab that came as a result of COVID-19 to give away America's greatness and power in both energy and leadership in order to set the stage for the rise of the Antichrist, a global reset, a new world order to be set in place by a new radical climate change agenda. The deliveries of the red heifer were just one more piece that's calling the Jews back home. It's one of those things when you look at it you can't imagine that anybody could have contrived it it was God everything that's going on shouldn't cause you to panic it's God the world's not falling apart it's falling into place it's God he's trying to get our attention the world may not see it but he wants your attention he wants you to be ready hallelujah The delivery of the red heifers in Israel is being called by the Jews the most important prophetic events, events since the rebirth of the nation of Israel. There's another subject I can't get into of time. Found out back in April that the symbolic Sanhedrin court anointed a Messiah to be king on the Passover in the same way that David was anointed to be king while Saul was still reigning. Rav Shlomo Yehuda is a 32-year-old genius who's memorized not just the Torah and its commentaries, but hundreds of books. He's even performing miracles. One miracle he performed on a wedding. 
Orthodox Jews, old men, long-bearded men, by the thousands are flocking to hear him speak. He's sitting in a chair, just a 32, 33-year-old man, and they're grabbing his hand. They're kissing it. He's laying hands on them to bless them. Those old men are weeping. Why? Because they feel like they found their Messiah. I don't have time to talk about that. In fact, I need you to stand. The red heifer does not matter to you. We are not looking for a red heifer. Jesus Christ fulfilled that role. We're not looking for a Messiah. Ours already came. Hebrews tells us, in fact, if you go, if you go and look in the Old Testament, look at the pattern of the Old Testament, there were no seats, no chairs in the temple or the tabernacle because of the work of the priest was never done. The blood work was never done, so there was no place to sit down. There was no place to rest. But Hebrews 10 and 11 said, But every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Why? Because there was no remission. Remission wasn't offered until Acts chapter 2. But this man, speaking of Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. There was no place in the temple or the tabernacle to sit down. The priests were constantly standing. But when Jesus finished the blood work, he sat down because the blood work was finished. One rabbi said, we've been waiting for this day for 2,000 years. Finally, it has come. Yes, but so have we. So have we. <coughs> the Jews who realized this is the greatest event to take place after the rebirth of Israel in 1948, they begin to dance, sing, and rejoice because their Messiah was coming. I told my wife, I said, it amazes me. They're more aware of the signs of the time than many Christian pastors are. Why are we not singing, shouting, and dancing? Because Jesus is coming back. When you tell people the Lord's coming back, many of them want him to wait a little while and give us more time. Not to reach people. That may be what they say, but it's so they can do the things they want. They've got plans. They want to do things before they have to go up there and find out what's in store. The red heifers will be qualified for sacrifice next fall on Tishri 1, which is also the day that the Jewish leaders, whatever this symbolic Sanhedrin court is, are planning to present their Messiah to the world. And if the Shemitah cycles and the Bereshit timelines are right, the rapture and the tribulation could happen this year. Are you ready? Are you ready? Someone said, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. Have you been baptized in his name? Let me just be real plain. I'm not apologizing, but let me be real plain to you. Somebody got really offended here a while back, said they heard me make this statement and they shut it off. Jesus told Nicodemus, except the man is born again of the water and the spirit, you're not going to heaven. Do you realize that? Can you just let that sink in? If you are not born of the water and the spirit, you are not going to heaven. Your wife can't get you there. Your parents can't get you there. I know your pastor and his family love you, but they can't get you there. The message will only help those who obey it. The greatest sinners that ever lived on the earth were the ones that crucified the Savior. And Peter preached to them and said, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. And they were pricked in their hearts. Such conviction was overwhelming. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? One translation said, men and brethren, is there a remedy? Is there a remedy? Peter didn't say, no, you get, you're going to get what's coming to you. No, he died for them too. He said, there is a remedy. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you've not repented, you can do it here tonight. If you've not been baptized, we've got water. You can do it here tonight. And when you make an approach to God, he will make an approach to you. If you are not born again of the water and spirit, you're not going to heaven. You don't need a preacher to lie to you. You can't find accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior in the Bible. It's not there. If you want to be saved, just obey the plan that was preached on the birthday of the church. I don't know how you do your Wednesday nights, but I like giving altar call if that's all right. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you're not where you ought to be with God, if you've never repented, would you step out? Would you join us in the front? Maybe you've been in the church for years and you're just excited because the Lord's coming and you want God to use you as a witness. Would you come? Would you join us in the front? Would you find a place to talk to God? He's coming. I want to be ready when he returns. He's not out to get you, to destroy you, to ruin your life. He wants to save you. You're the reason that he came. You're the reason that he died. Take advantage of it today. Take advantage of that gift today. Parents, you ought to thank God every day. You've got a pastor that loves you enough to preach to your children. Don't side with your children, side with your pastor. He's trying to save them. He's trying to make sure they get to heaven. Jesus is coming. He's trying to get our attention. Let's get his attention tonight.
lift our hands right now. Receive this word that we've heard. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's respond to that word. Let's pour our hearts out to God right now. God sent Pastor Moses to come in and shake the apathy from our lives. We can't afford to be apathetic in this last hour. We can't afford to be a sardis and sleep when we should be watching. Jesus, shake us, Lord. Come on, church. God is here to meet us. God is here to meet us tonight. Listen, if you feel the need to be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus, we'll baptize you tonight. We got to believe it. There is no other way. As Pastor Moses was saying, and echoing what Pastor Hammond said about the rapture anxiety, you know, the world is gripped with fear right now, but church, it's not a time to fear. It's a time to go after lost souls as never before. To grab a Bible chart and to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and to ask God to give you the territory, to give you the territory at your work. Don't let your work be the same place ever again. That is your mission field. There's souls all around. God is coming soon. He's coming soon. It's more than just being ready ourselves. We've got a work to do. Amen? He said, occupy till I come. Thank you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And my God, what a word tonight. God help it to be etched in our spirit. Forever etched. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Moses. What a word from heaven. One more time, give him a hand. My Lord, what a word tonight. It's not a time to fear. It's time to walk in faith. Amen. You are dismissed in the lovely name of Jesus Christ.